Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here, and welcome back to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are visiting visiting with Katie Dodderer, and she teach, specializes in teaching ag education language courses, specifically for Spanish and English. So she helps people learn either Spanish or English as a second language in agriculture which I think is super cool and unique and important as well. So she's very passionate about bridging the language and cultural gap between these different cultures in the ag workforce. And so today we're going to talk about how she does that, as well as what impacts are being seen in businesses and workplaces where this is happening. Now, before we dive into that, I do want to remind you that if you are looking for a speaker for your next event, whether that's online or in person, I am available for the end of 2024 and into 2025 for whether that's a panel, a workshop, or a keynote. I would love to connect and communicate with your audience and be a part of making your event something great. So if you're interested in that, please go to my website, which is in the show notes, and you can contact me there. But with that, let's visit with Katie. All right, Katie, it is a pleasure to be visiting with you today and just learning more about what you are doing in the beef, well, in the agriculture industry, what you're doing isn't specific to the beef industry, even though that's kind of who our audience is going to be right now. But it, um, what you're doing, I think, is unique and very much needed and important. And so to start off, I think I'd really just like to hear a little bit more about who you are and what you are doing today in the agriculture industry. Sure. So thank you first off for having me on here. I I love sharing what I do because what I do with others brings me a lot of joy and it makes like huge, well, maybe not huge, but small impacts, which are fine with me in the ag industry. So what I do is I am trying to bridge the cultural and language gap that we have in the U.S. agriculture industry. I do have an ag background. I grew up on a dairy farm and that's where I got my first experience with it. And I took the two years in, in uh, of Spanish in high school and it wasn't for me. And I've always loved the Spanish language, by the way. I actually started learning in third grade. That's another story for another day. Um, but yeah, currently what I'm doing, I, this was a side hustle actually uh, that I started when I was a dairy farmer and it just morphed into, I decided to take the big risk to uh, make it my full-time career. And so far I'm glad I did it. So I teach Spanish and English as a second language, both online and in person. I'm actually getting a lot more opportunities right now to do it in person, which I absolutely love because I think establishing um, that trust and the relationship with other people is really important. And all of my students are adults. They are in the ag industry. I have taught um, farmers, veterinarians, pharmaceutical reps, hoof trimmers, you name it, I probably had them. And I have people from all sectors, really, dairy, swine, poultry. I've had some beef uh, professionals and uh, I'm branching into the produce sectors as well. So you have a dairy background and you said that's kind of where you're, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of where your passion for this bridging this gap started. Yes. Yes. Um, So I was a third generation farmer turned first generation farmer. So my my family still operates to this day. They have a, a dairy in central Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so if you would have asked me in high school, hey, Katie, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? I had have told you I was going to be part of the third generation at home. Well, um, obviously that didn't happen. It did happen for a few years, but then I left and uh, started and co-owned my own dairy farm as a first generation dairy farmer for 13 years. And uh, I had to walk away from it about three years ago. And so anyway, during the, I was a senior in high school when my family started hiring Spanish speakers uh, to the milking team, because it is ridiculously hard. It still is to find people that want to milk cows, really people that want to work in agriculture and do the dirty jobs like milk cows, shovel manure, you know, all those types of things. And I'll never forget his name. His name was Octavio. He was from Mexico. 
And again, senior in high school, I had done the two years, wasn't impressed. Like I was really let down in high school because uh, I really wanted to be fluent. And so I kind of just gave up on it until that my senior year of high school, that summer I milked. So my family milks three times a day. I was on the third shift, uh, milked nights with Octavio and he taught me so much. So it just reignited my passion for the language, for the culture again. And I had went to school I have a very unconventional uh, educational path. My first degree is in business management and marketing. And then I went back actually in my mid twenties, uh, amid <laughs> trying to run, co-own a dairy, like as a first generation farmer, I remember taking classes in between milking cows, doing payroll, uh, managing employees. It was, I look back and I'm like, how the heck did I do that? But I went back to school for Spanish to become fluent and really study it. Uh, in my mid 20s. So I was the oldest in my classes, but um, that's where it started. And then as a first generation dairy farmer, I had my own team. I had six people on my team and five of them were Spanish speakers. And it always bothered me when I looked at other farms, right? Like this is, this is not unique to my farm. It wasn't unique to my family farm. There's a lot of, um, the last I looked, there's 70% of the agricultural workforce in the US speak Spanish. And it bothered me that one, they were being treated like second-class citizens just because they spoke a different language because they had a different skin tone. And I'm not, this isn't everybody, um, but it also bothered me that they also got less wages. Like they were doing the same amount of work and they were there the same amount of time as their American counterparts, but yet their wages were, were smaller just because again, they were from some part of South America. And so we always talk about, and I was, I've, I do a lot of advocating for agriculture, not so much now because my focus is switched, but we always talk about the gap, right? Between agriculture and the people not in agriculture, right? Our 2% versus the 98%. But I was noticing the gap within agriculture. And that was the gap between Spanish and English, that gap between cultures, and a lot of misunderstandings and unfortunately a lot of arrogance. So um, as a Spanish teacher, then I was like, well, why don't I just bring this to agriculture and, and see what we can do to help bridge this together. So with that gap, can you talk a little bit more about why it's so important for workforces or not workforces, why it's so important for employers, other employees to bridge this gap themselves culturally and the language side? Like what are the benefits to the workplace? What are the benefits to employee morale? Like what do you see when this gap is bridged even just a little bit? Short answer, respect. Respect is huge on both parts. You will not get respect um, unless you give respect. And that's 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 really the key and the, the meat and potatoes of what I do. I can't tell you the the best, my favorite part about what I do is the feedback that I get from my students, right? So yeah, I do send out a survey at the end of class to tell me what can I do better, what blah, 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 blah. But the best feedback is the unsolicited feedback when they're like, hey, Katie, here's my homework. And by the way, this happened. So I'm just going to share a small story with you quick, just to kind of illustrate what, what impact this can make on your team and the people that you work with. Uh, one of my students, this was a few years ago, she was a milk tester out in Wisconsin. And she was only in my, she was about halfway through my class. And she's like, hey, can you jump on Zoom early tonight? I need to tell you what happened. And I was like, okay. So I did. And she said, so I've been going to this dairy and testing milk for years. And it's a large dairy. It's about five, 6,000 cows. I go in and do my job. Every, all the Hispanics do their job. And we just, that's it. We don't communicate, nothing. She said, but I took your advice because we start off with the basics, right? I teach you how to say hello, good morning, good afternoon. It's very simple. Um, and we do, we are, it's very simple sentences by week three, which is really exciting because I, by the way, I teach my classes how I wish I would have been taught in high school. Maybe I would have went on in high school to take all the mm -hmm. levels. I don't know. Um, but I know that time is of the essence, especially for people in agriculture. Anyway, she said, so I walk in and I was really nervous. And I just said, buenos dias. All I said was good morning. And you should have seen their faces light up. They were so excited. That they're like, look at this gringa trying to speak Spanish. <laughs> She's like, that, their smile is just, just lit me up. So she said that shift went so fast. It was the fastest I've ever tested milk on a dairy. She said, 
they were teaching me Spanish. I was teaching them English. And she said, this, th it was just awesome. However, here's the kicker to the story. During this awesome milking shift, a blizzard had come through. We're talking Wisconsin, right? So she said, I forget how many feet of snow it dumped in a matter of like six or seven hours. She said, but I went out to load my milk samples and the whole crew had cleaned off my car for me. I didn't ask them to, I didn't tell them, to, like they just did it out of, they were so excited. And so I said, do you, do you know, do you realize the amount of respect that you garnered in just that one milking shift? So it's stories like that. And that's just one. I mean, I could, we could do a whole podcast mm -hmm. on these stories. And I, when they email them to me too, I copy and paste them into a word doc because I'm not going to lie. Doing what I do is hard. Um, some people don't see the value in what I do, which I hope they do at some point. So I go back and I review those stories and I'm like, okay, this is making a difference. Not just, and it's not for me, right? It's for the ag industry as a whole. And so it's just, it's, it's awesome. People, people really are, I wish more people would even, like give it a chance. I get all the time. Oh, I'm too old to learn a language. No, you're not. My oldest student is 74. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Tell me a little bit about what it looks like to you learn a second language with you? How do you kind of have classes set up? Are they in person? Are they virtual? You mentioned Zoom. So I'm assuming there's some virtual component to it, but tell me more about that. Yeah. The Spanish classes right now are all online. I am, like I said, um, entertaining some opportunities to teach in person. And then my hope is that you want to continue with that. So my classes right now all online, it's an, um, I actually just switched it from an eight week to a nine week course because the feedback that I've been getting from my students is like, we just want more, one more week, one more week. And it's so funny because it's coming from students that are like, hmm, I don't know, eight weeks is going to be a lot. And they're like, no, we want another week. Um, we're learning the basics right from the get-go, right? Greetings, uh, your numbers. We actually practice numbers uh, in ear tag form, right? So I will write ear tag numbers and we will say them like ear tags. So, I mean, this these classes, I have written this curriculum from scratch. Um, from my boots on the ground experience as a farmer. So ear tags, we're doing um, obviously alphabet, but we're putting simple sentences together by week three. And I'm talking like, la vaca está enferma, the cow is sick. How freaking important is it to know that, you know? Or simple, one of my favorite lessons to teach is prepositions. So if you don't remember what those are, <laughs> they are to the right, to the left, to the front, to the back, inside, outside. How often, think about it, how often are you trying to explain to somebody where something is located? Oh, hey, can you grab the bucket, I don't know, behind the door in the office? S simple things like that, but you're able to put those together. So there is homework, but I am cognizant of the fact that my students are adults. We have families, we have a full-time job, we travel. So your homework's gonna take you maybe 30 minutes and that's just a homework. Like if you're really into it and you're looking at the vocab and you're memorizing that a little more, um, which by the way, all the vocabulary is specific to the industry. So right now, like I mentioned, I teach for dairy, swine and poultry, but just, I just want people to know, because I get this question all the time. Well, Katie, I'm in the beef industry or I'm in the produce industry. Are your classes still going to be applicable? Absolutely. Yeah. We might have a list of like specific dairy or milking parlor terminology, but all the other vocab, like weather vocab, days of the week, months of the year, um, things like wheelbarrow, bucket, pipe, tank, all of those are uh, used throughout, you know, across all industries, really. So they're very applicable. And by the end of the nine week course, uh, there is what I call a cumulative assessment. It's my fancy way to say a final exam. But the feedback I get from students, it's it's like 20 sentences, but we're taking everything that we've learned over those nine weeks. And when my students are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just translated all of these sentences in a matter of nine weeks. And I'm like, look at you go. See, it's not that hard. It Spanish. Shay, Spanish is actually a very easy language to learn. And people don't believe me. They're like, oh, well, you're just saying that because you're fluent. And like, no, really, it's actually easier than English because I also teach English and that's a bear to teach. Do you have more people come to you to learn English or more people come to you to learn Spanish? Right now, Spanish. Um, with, so 
the peeps, people are starting to realize that when they learn a little bit of Spanish, and by the way, I'm not asking you to be fluent. I do offer two levels of each uh, beginners mm -hmm. and an intermediate, but what we're finding is, is if you take that first step and learn some Spanish, you are going to then motivate any Spanish speaker that you are working with to learn English. So in the past couple of years, as I have made this my full-time career, I've actually had quite a bit of um, interest and intrigue from the Hispanic community to learn English. So I do teach English as a second language. Uh, I do, I'm do. i doing that right now with one farm uh, in person every Wednesday. So I get to teach that tonight. It's my favorite part of the week. Um, and what I'm trying to do though, since there's only one of me right now, um, I'm trying to create an online program so that I can serve the broader Hispanic community within the U.S. agriculture industry. Do you see, <clears throat> excuse me, do you see like companies paying for any of their employees to learn a second language? Is there, have you seen any of that yet? I have. Some do. I wish more would because I I feel like this needs, companies need to realize this is a form of professional development. Um, you are investing in your employees to communicate better. And I think, I mean, so the short answer to your question is yes, because I, people, companies, organizations are realizing that that first person, when they go on farm, I don't care what farm you're talking about. But chances are anymore, that person in charge, that person that you're going to talk to first might not be the farm owner. It might now be the farm manager, or it might be a herds person. And that person just might be a Spanish speaker. So again, it goes back to respect. I'm, I get a lot of people are like, oh, they're in this, this country, they should learn English, which don't get me started on that. <laughs> um, but there's nothing wrong with you meeting halfway. Um, and if I can just clarify that real quick of when people say that to me, because I get it all the time, um, we actually don't have an official language in the U.S. You can Google it. Google um, what is the official language of the U.S. It will say we don't have one. And that is for a reason. We are supposed to be this melting pot, salad bowl, whatever analogy you want to put to it, to welcome all types of, of people, languages, cultures, whatnot. Um that's just my my opinion on that. But again, there's just show some respect. Learn how to say good morning. Learn how to say some numbers. It's not hard. Hey, folks, if you want to start your own podcast, I will be the first to support you. Podcasts are an amazing method of building up your personal brand, increasing sales for your business, and applying your passion, all while sharing conversations and ideas that matter. With millions of podcasts that are out there today, I want yours to belong to the 50% that are successful, and more importantly, I want you to enjoy what you do. Check my show notes for a link to my website with free resources and different opportunities to help you get started on the right foot. So with that, what tips do you have to maybe either lessen the stress or make it a little easier to learn a second language, whether that's mindset or anything tactical or just share some tips if you would? One is attitude. You've got to have a really good attitude about it. And the biggest thing that I tell my students is you have to laugh at yourself. I've been speaking Spanish for over a decade now, and I still mess up here and there. Like I, you know, I'm like everybody else. I have a lot on my plate. Sometimes when I'm in a hurry, something comes out really awful or um, whatever. But so the confidence, confidence, I also help you with in the class as well. One of the biggest things I'll tell you if you're looking to learn any language is memorization. So when I went back to school for it, I had to take three linguistic psychology classes, which I know sounds super nerdy, but they were super interesting. And that taught me how as adults, how we acquire a second language versus how we acquire our first language, our L1. And our brains are not fully developed until we're 25. So after 25 and most of my students are, I'm going to say the, the median age range for my students are is like 45, 50. Um, I have, you know, on the younger and also have older, um, but memorization is key. So I actually, with my class, I already have pre-made digital flashcards of every single vocabulary word that we go over. But I also really encourage students to 
look at those lists, look at those flashcards and jot down the ones that you, you know, you use frequently and make your own flashcards with those. We are so used now, used to technology and typing everything. I can't tell you like the science behind literally writing things out is it's going to make it stick in your, your long-term memory more. So the vocabulary list, I think can be a little overwhelming, but again, I'm just like, Hey, you don't use this word frequently. Okay, cool. Like, don't worry about it. Jot down the ones that you do so that you can remember them better. That's interesting. What you said about, you know, how writing things down actually helps your memory better. And I've heard that quite a bit. I've actually had the a business coach that I've worked with before has really said, she said, no, write these things down. Don't type them. And that's also something I picked up on when I was in college, there was like a couple of weeks at the beginning of a semester where I tried typing all my notes and compared to writing them, I retained way more when I was writing them, even though it took a little longer. Yeah. So I think that's can really I, interesting. Can I go back to real quick, when you asked me about companies uh, paying for or helping their employees pay for my courses. So I've just, I wanted to say that I've seen it done a couple different ways because <clears throat> I do think it's important for a student to have skin in the game. I've had companies pay for their employees 100% and that student doesn't really show up to class, which you don't have to, by the way, which I should mention, the classes are live, but recorded. So actually a lot of my students will take the classes via recordings, um, but you do have that option for live. You also have access to me, I answer a lot of student questions via email, or if you got a laundry list of questions, we can hop on a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call. Um, but the companies that have either like pay a portion of it up front for the student, or they have the student, they have the person pay for it up front and then reimburse them on receipt of that cumulative assessment and the okay for me to say, hey, yeah, this person did did complete the work. Maybe they didn't they didn't show up live because I mean my students are from. California to Delaware. So I'm dealing with all the different time zones. So I get it if you can't attend live, but I look at, did you complete some homework? Were you communicative with me? Did you complete the cumulative assessment? Then you completed the course. I also can see on my end what you've opened and what you haven't. So there's that. So on the beef side, are you primarily working with, do you see like feedlot? people come in or packing plant, or is there a specific kind of segment within the beef industry where you're seeing more individuals funnel in? The beef uh, people that I've seen so far have been um, feedlots and nutritionists actually, because nutritionists are realizing that when they go to a farm that nine chances out of 10, and I'm just pulling that number out, but I've got a lot of them that are like, Hey, you know what? It used to be, I talked to the the farm owner, but now I'm talking to the, like the herds person or the manager and they speak Spanish. And, you know, most of the times if they're, if a person has been promoted to that, they are going to speak some English, but again, it goes back to respect, you know, like they, if you walk on farm for the first time as a nutritionist, so let's just say, and you greet them with, hola, buenos dias, como estas? Hi, good morning. How are you? They're gonna be like, wait, what? This is cool. Like you, you actually took the time to learn some of my language. Like, I don't know if you've ever traveled, but I travel, I love to travel. And when I do that and somebody um, speaks English, where I, if I'm in a place that doesn't, right. And I'm just like, oh, hey, cool. Like, you know, some, like it shows me that you took some time somewhere, some, some day, I don't know when, uh, to learn a little bit about another language and another culture. Well, I think, you know, in my case, I thought, I took a couple classes in Spanish and then that actually wasn't quite enough for what I needed for my college degree. So I had to kind of retake all this basic Spanish in college. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to need it. I have my own business, yada, yada, yada. Well, a few years ago in one of my mastermind calls, or I call them rancher minds, but there was a gal who hopped a rancher from Mexico and she hopped on and she could understand English and she could speak some of it. But I think that when that happened, I was like, you know, it would be beneficial if I could communicate better with her before or after or during this call too. And we made it work, but it was kind of one of those moments where, yeah, I thought I didn't need it, but it definitely did. It could have, it would have been beneficial. Yeah. I, um, it honestly, it's not just the ag industry anymore. I have been in stores just, you know, around here 
And actually this just happened last week. The post office called me. My So I live in Gettysburg. The Gettysburg post office called me. I know um, a lot of people that work there. And they called me and they were like, hey, we have a gentleman here that does not speak any English. We know you speak Spanish. Can you help us figure out what he needs? So I did. I got on the phone with him and um, it was he was looking for a package that just didn't get delivered. And we had a great conversation. So I love that. I love the fact that I, for me anyway, I can help other people. And that was just a small little thing, right? But he was so like grateful. He's like, thank you so much. Do you teach English? And I'm like, matter of fact, I do. <laughs> Um, Because he wants, and that's, I'm just going to clear that up real quick. A lot of them do want to learn English. We just haven't given them a, uh, we haven't really given them really good options. So that's what I'm currently working on uh, right now. But I also just got back in Greece and I cannot tell you, I, I was shocked the amount of times that I got to use my Spanish. Shocked. Like I was over there like, okay, I don't know Greek at all. I was trying to learn it, which by the way is a very hard language to learn. But holy cow, the amount of times I got to use my Spanish, it's so it's not just I don't want people to think you're pigeonholing yourself to an industry or to a country because you're not. Spanish is actually one of the most uh, popular languages in the world. Awesome. Well, Katie, is there anything else that you want to share today before we wrap up our conversation? Just give it a shot. Give give learning Spanish a, a, a you know a fair shot, and don't be scared. That's my biggest thing as adults. We are we we need to take some more lessons from children. By the way, um, don't be scared if it's something you've always wanted to do, or you know that it would definitely help enhance the communication. And really, again, I'm going back to respect um, among your team on farm. Let me know uh, the next. Uh, I do three sessions a year, by the way. So check out my my website, agvocate.com. You can email me if you want more information. Uh, and yeah, I, I love working with all sectors of ag. And I think that's it for now. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for taking time to visit with me and share your knowledge and encouragement with my listeners. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. If you're interested in learning more about who Katie is and what she does, follow along on her website or you can email her. I'll include both of those, her website and her email in the show notes. And that is agvocate, as in like advocacy for agriculture and a play on her name. So it's, uh, that's fun. And you can follow her on social media as well. But with that, remember the best way to support your favorite podcast is to share with a friend and give a review. Have a great day, folks. Happy ranching.